In our last session, we looked at electrode kinetics and how these would have an effect on the current at an electrode. So now what we're going to do is examine what happens as we vary potentials, as we apply a potential to an electrochemical cell. We introduced last time the Butler-Volmer equation, which showed us how we balanced a reductive process with an oxidative process. Remember that we were talking about J in terms of current density, and the Butler-Volmer equation shows how this varies with respect to the applied potential, this overpotential eta. The total current sum is therefore the sum of the oxidative process and the reductive process. Both of these, we see this eta term, this overpotential term appears in both, so both are affected by the potential that we apply. Fundamentally, the observed current that we see in our cell only applies on the exchange current density, which is this J0, and our overpotential eta. Our alpha term that we've expressed here is simply a measure of the symmetry between the oxidative and reductive processes. Where alpha is 0.5, the rate of reduction is the same as the rate of oxidation at each electrode, where the number of electrons exchanged is equal to 1. OK, so now let's look at how current varies with overpotential. This graph that we showed in the last slide simply shows the anode rate and the cathode rate. So the oxidative current here in red on the top, by convention this is positive, while the cathode current, the reduction, is happening here in blue. And what we see is the sum of these two curves. This purple line up the middle shows what direction the current flows as we apply different overpotentials to our cell. So remember the overpotential is simply the difference between the equilibrium potential and the potential that we're applying to our cell. What we see very rapidly is as we get to extreme values of overpotential, one component very rapidly begins to dominate. So where eta is plus or minus 0.1, so if you have plus or minus 0.1 overpotential applied to our cell, we generally get one term dominating. If we look at the left-hand component, we're saying that this oxidative component dominates if our overpotential is greater than plus 0.1 volts, while the reductive process would dominate if our overpotential is less than minus 0.1 volts. So what this means overall is that unless we have a very, very small overpotential, we will really only see the current coming from either the oxidative process or the reductive process. Only at very small magnitudes of n will we see our current actually having competition between oxidation and reduction. What we now need to do is think about what this J0, this exchange current density, and this symmetry component. Let's, we need to find out what these terms are. So our exchange current density and our symmetry factor alpha cannot be measured directly. So this exchange current density is simply what the current is, or the exchange current at equilibrium is, while the alpha component is simply a reduction contribution to the Gibbs energy. So the greater alpha, remember this is a proportion, it's a fraction, the greater alpha is, the greater the reductive component to the overall Gibbs energy. If we look at a situation where we have alpha is 0.5, so this is a symmetrical situation where the reductive and oxidative processes are contributing equally to the overall current we observe, well, we see that, yes, at these extreme values of our overpotential, we have our reduction dominating at very low overpotentials, and we have our oxidation dominating at very high overpotentials. So let's consider what happens when eta is greater than 0.1 volts, or the magnitude of eta is greater than 0.1 volts. Well, if we say that eta is greater than 0.1 plus 0.1 volts, if we look at this reductive term, the reductive term simply shrinks to zero. We get a very simple format for our overall current density. If, on the other hand, we consider what happens when eta is less than minus 0.1 volts, now our oxidative term shrinks into obscurity, and we get a simple expression in terms of the reductive process. Now that we've established this, how do we now find our exchange current density and alpha? Well, we have an equation here. We've seen equations like this before. It's, this is a very similar format to the Arrhenius equation, which you've dealt with before, you've linearized before. So, so if we think about linearizing this form of equation, we get onto plotting data on a graph. The name for these plots are called Tafel plots. They allow the determination of our fractional symmetry component and our exchange current density. In order to do one of these plots, we simply plot the log of the current density against the overpotential. So remember, we simplified the Butler-Volmer equation for a particular case of high eta, high overpotential. 
And remember, one of these terms drops out depending on whether we're negative 0.1 or positive 0.1. So let's look at the reductive process to start with. So we're dealing with eta is less than minus 0.1 volts. If we take logarithms of both sides, we simply get up this sort of relationship and we should immediately recognize this where we have a y equals mx plus c type equation where the variable eta we're plotting against log of j and we should get a graph with a gradient of alpha f over rt. And sure enough, when we plot these, we find that the reductive component where, where eta is less than minus 0.1 volts, we see sure enough, we get a linear range. It starts to deviate at very low over potentials because as we said, we start to get a contribution from the oxidative component. So that causes a deviation from linearity. So this gives us an equation for the reductive component and we can do the same for the oxidative component and we get the right hand side of the curve. We simply plot log j against the over potential which allows us to very simply find the exchange current density. If we look at this, remember, y equals mx plus c type graph, our intercept should be log of j0, the log of that exchange current density, and the gradient allows us to easily find this symmetry component alpha. It's important to remember that a TAFL plot will not be symmetrical. So depending on the value of our symmetry factor alpha, we will get a different shaped TAFL plot. So if alpha is 0.2, we enhance the oxidative component. We have a much greater contribution to the current from the oxidative component. While if alpha is much greater, we have the symmetry factor is much greater. That means we have a much greater contribution from the reductive component. But regardless of what this value of alpha might be, this intercept will be common to both sides of the graph and both will give us a value for that exchange current density. Let's look at the features of these Tafel plots. We said a little bit about this deviation from linearity. They're curved at these small over potentials because what's happening is we get both reduction and oxidation contribute to the current that we observe. If we go to higher over potentials, the competing process tends to zero and we get increasing confirmation to this linear fit. The straight line section will allow us to find our exchange current density J0 from the intercept and alpha from the gradient. It's worth giving some thought to these logarithms. Often when we do theory, we use natural logarithms because of the prevalence of the exponential term E. But when we do things practically, we almost always plot log base 10. So often we use this log base 10. But it's important to remember they are the same mathematical function and there's a simple linear relationship between them where the log of one term j is simply 2.3 or 3 times the log base 10 of j. So always remember that, that these logarithmic relationships are the same just with a scaling factor. The symmetry factor can be a source of some confusion, so it's worth spending some time on what this means as well. We introduced it earlier as a free energy contribution from the reductive process, but it's simply a balance between those oxidation and re reduction currents. So at very low alpha, if we look at how the current responds to the over potential, we see at low alpha, the oxidative current responds much more readily to the applied over potential than the reductive current. So oxidation would be favored at low alpha, where we see this positive response. And it increases much more rapidly with the applied over potential. If we go the other way and consider alpha of 0.07, we see the reverse is true, where we get the reduction process favored, where reduction current increases much more rapidly with eta. Because that kind of gives an overview of what this symmetry factor is. The exchange current density, however, is slightly more unusual to consider. This is simply termed the equilibrium current exchange. It is the rate of charge transfer at the electrode at equilibrium. So there's no net transfer, but it's a measure of how much charge comes from the ions at the surface into the electrode or from the electrode out to the ions. Remember those two terms balance. The more readily they can exchange those electrons, the more readily the system can deliver a current without significant energy loss. Fundamentally, what this does is it affects the over potential required to deliver a specific current. So if we look at the graph, this is showing what happens at to the current voltage response at, at different exchange current densities. So let's firstly define a fixed current density of 0.5 microamps per square meter. So to deliver this current, we find that if we have a high exchange current density at our electrode, so if our electrode naturally has a high exchange current density, we only have to apply an over potential of 0.2 volts. However, as we have 
lower and lower exchange current densities, we find we have to apply a greater and greater overpotential in order to deliver that same current. If we have a low exchange current density, that means we have a less charge transfer at equilibrium, which means we have to apply this larger overpotential to drive the net current forward. So what kind of factors affect the exchange current density? Well, we said that there are electrode processes, and we said it was a characteristic of the electrode and the, the solute that we were looking at. So let's consider the kinetics of what's going on. If we think about what's going on at the electrode, if we consider something with a high exchange current density, so quite a high exchange current density is 10 amps per square meter. So an example of this is a single electron process. So iron ferrocyanate can be reduced to another iron ferrocyanate compound, but notice there's only a single electron going on there and there's no bonds being broken. So there's no, ch no significant change in the solute. So it's very easy for it to pick up an electron, very easy for it to give it up, which leads to us having a higher exchange current density. Another thing which favors a high exchange current density is having no adsorption. So adsorption is when a species will chemically bond with the surface. So in this case, I've shown hydrogen ions receiving an electron and the hydrogen atom forms a chemical bond with the surface. This reduces the exchange current density. So if we have no adsorption, then we would tend to get a higher exchange current density. And if the reactant and product have very similar properties, then again, we would expect to have a high exchange current. It's very easy for those electrons to exchange across the interface. If, however, we consider a low exchange current density, the reverse would apply. So if you have a very complex process, we have lots of things going on at once, or if we have to break a chemical bond, or if we had to adsorb onto the surface, these are factors that would favor a low exchange current density. An example of this, where we have the azide nitrogen couple picking up an electron, the exchange current density is absolutely minuscule because the strength of the nitrogen bond makes it extremely difficult to drive that process forward. The electrode material also affects the exchange current density. So for a given reaction, so I'm just going to talk about the reduction of protons in a hydrogen standard electrode. So let's consider this couple. At a platinum electrode, we have an exchange current density of 10 to the minus three, so one ten thousandth of an amp per square meter. While if we deal with a mercury electrode, our exchange current density drops massively. And fundamentally this happens because of a different mechanism of exchange, a different way in which the charge is transferred. Platinum fundamentally has catalytic properties. This is something that should be well known to you and is dealt with quite extensively in the inorganic chemistry side of things. But as a result of those catalytic properties, the surface affects the kinetics of the process. So let's explore the process a little bit. Our first step is hydrogen being reduced and absorbing to the surface. So we form this metal hydrogen bond here. We then have one of two processes that can then occur. Either a second hydrogen, which, which is absorbed to the surface, can form a bond directly with the hydrogen and break the metal hydrogen bonds and release our H2 gas. Or what we can have is we can have another proton coming in and being reduced and simultaneously forming that hydrogen gas release. So these are the three steps that we wish to consider. But depending on the rates of each one and the rate at which each one occurs will affect the overall rate of our reaction. For mercury and lead, a metal hydrogen bond is very, very weak. So that means that this metal hydrogen bond formation becomes the rate determining step. If we consider step B, where we have the adsorbed hydrogen coming together to form H2 gas, in platinum, this becomes the rate determining step because the metal hydrogen bond is considerably stronger. So this is our rate determining step in platinum. Step C is generally slower because it involves more species, but this can also happen in platinum as well. But we need to factor in the relative strengths of these metal hydrogen bonds. And for a good catalyst, it has to strike a balance between steps. It has to strike a balance between the formation of the metal hydrogen bond and then the subsequent breaking of metal hydrogen bonds. It just so happens that platinum strikes this balance and makes it very effective as a catalyst, while for mercury, lead and so on, this bond is very weak, which means it doesn't favor the formation and the surface absorption of hydrogen. When we're considering our current potential curves, we need to consider both the oxidation and reduction currents because they both contribute towards the process that we measure.
The symmetry factors, the rate at which oxidation and reduction contribute, affect the shapes of the curves that we've observed. So whether we have a process which strongly favours oxidation or strongly favours the reduction, these all work together to affect the shape of the curve that we observe. And fundamentally, when we make our measurements and look at the rate at which the current is affected by the overpotential, the shape of the curve gives us insight to the processes going on at those electrodes. The exchange current is also something that's worth looking at as well, because the exchange current affects the ability for a given cell to deliver a current at a given overpotential. And these exchange currents are affected directly by solution kinetics and electrode effects.